Glenoble is an expert of optimization, so mathematical optimization for smart grids, and he also has some major industrial experience. This is why uh, I'm particularly glad that he's here today. So I asked him, it is going to be tough, it's going to be difficult because the time is limited. We originally planned for six hours, right? But then we had to shrink it to four because of time limitations with the school and other sessions going on in the afternoon. So I thank Laurent for adapting so quickly to the change. And also, um, I would like him, I asked him to give you some, some uh, idea of what's important uh, from an industrial point of view, so what are the rele relevant problems in the smart grid community, what has to be done there, uh, how to use the renewable energy, how to distribute it, how to optimize the use of that. Um, technically, so in terms of practical products, what are the really important things that the industry is looking at. And then uh, we also are supposed to have another section where we go more mathematical. So we are going to, is going to address some um, optimization strategies, so some theory, to uh, turn the practical things that are important for the industry in some relevant and interesting technical problems that have to be tackled mathematically. So we have both sides uh, of, of, the, of the problem here today, and we, we try to, I hope, will be successful in explaining them. So thank you so much again. No problem, thank you. Yeah. So yes, indeed, the presentation will be about uh, optimization, which is necessarily a bit mathematical. And then in the second half of the presentation, I'll try to come back to actual uh, applications, so energy problems. But we'll have to bear with some uh, mathematics in the beginning, not too much, hopefully. So my name is Florent Cadou. Uh, I'm from Grenoble, which is a city pretty similar to here, actually. So I'm very glad to be here because it reminds me of home. Uh, it's uh, also a city which is uh, surrounded by mountains like this. So it's the look and feel uh, is pretty similar to here with the mountains around and the a nice old historical city center. Uh, it's a place where we have a rich, relatively large electrical engineering lab, which uh, has a team that specializes on distribution grids. And so we have a, it's a long lasting partnership with the French distribution system operator. So it's a company that operates the medium and low voltage grids in 95% of France. So it's a very concentrated industry in France. We have one major actor. And uh, this uh, company is called Enedis, and they fund my research and the grants of my PhD students and my postdocs and so on. So it's, uh, uh, we have actually a small research team which is entirely funded by Enedis, and we call, we call this the Industrial Chair of Excellence on Smart Grids. So, so I'm, the, I'm holding this chair, and, and that's how I do my research. OK, so um, oh, Grenoble again. Now, about the introduction. So what I want to do is, uh, is twofold, really. So one thing is to introduce to you numerical optimization. I'm not sure if you've been taught this before. Actually, I could do a little uh, survey. How many of you have, let's say, taken at least one class of numerical optimization? Can you raise your hand? OK, that's quite a lot of people, actually. So uh, maybe you won't. So maybe half the audience will uh, not learn too many new things as far as theory is concerned. Um, OK, so. I'm going to talk about the mathematics, but without any technicalities. I just want you to get the ideas, the main ideas. It's not very important for me that you learn the proof of theorems and things like that. It's not the objective of a talk like this one. Um, what I like to do is to get people to actually do things, which in this context means uh, programming, because optimization is uh, very applied. It's a discipline where we have okay theorems and so on, but we also have software, which we call solvers and models. I will uh, come back to this later. And it's very useful uh, when, when teaching optimization to get people to spend half their time actually programming uh, things and solving actual problems with a computer. I think it's a very good way of, learn of learning. Unfortunately, I can't do this today because it's an uh, 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 oral presentation. But I think it's very important. So if you have any occasion to do this, uh, you can get for free optimization software on the internet and, uh, and practice. I think it's uh, really the only way to learn optimization. Um, OK. Um, now, if you, I mean, to be able to follow the talk, I think at least some elementary mathematics are necessary. It's not too much. And also, if you wanted to do the programming part, also you would need to know the basics of, of programming. Uh, now, for this first part of the presentation, um, so this is just for the first hour. 
I want to talk about optimization as a field, what it is and uh, what kind of problems we're trying to solve. And, and in second part, the main problem classes, which is the types of problems we know how to solve. Okay, we can't solve any problems far from that. There are categories, and some of them we can solve. Okay, so uh, what is what, what do I call what do we call numeric optimization? Um, it's a situation in which you want to solve a problem where you want to minimize the function function f, which is the objective function, or maximize the same thing. Let's say minimize. And you have constraints. So x is supposed to belong to uh, some set, which we call capital X. And also you have functional constraints. So functional constraints can be of two types. So g of x is uh, inequality type, and h of x is equality types. So this is a very abstract formulation, and it encompasses most of the optimization problems that we want to solve in, in practice. OK, so you know functions f, g, h, and x, so the objectiveness constraints. And you want to find some x bar, which is where f takes its minimal value among all the points that satisfy the constraints. Uh, of course, sometimes the set is infeasible. Sometimes uh, you can get f to take a value which is as small as you want. So if, there is a, if the prime is not bounded below, that it makes no sense. So it's not at this point, it's not guaranteed that the prime makes sense. But if it makes sense, then you want to find some x bar which minimizes function f. OK, um, some vocabulary. So the x, small x, it's called the decision variables or control variables. It's what you actually want in the end. So if you have a practical problem, what you want to do is to find the value of x, because in practice it means uh, something like, OK, x, if x1 has a value of 2, it could mean that you want to buy new, uh, two new machines or something like that. So x is what you want to implement in the real life in the end. Okay? If, we, if you consider a problem which is a unit commitment and dispatch problem, which is a power engineering problem, which I wanted to present, but I will skip that because it's, uh, yeah, I don't have enough time. So this very important problem consists in choosing for the next day which of the power units you will start, at what, at what time you will start them, and uh, how much power you will have them to produce. So right now there are people forecasting tomorrow's electrical demand, and they are quite good at that, so they have a very good forecast of what will be consumed tomorrow for the entire country, let's say Italy or France. And then you have a few hundred large generating units, and you want to send people who operate these units a schedule for tomorrow. Okay? So you have to start at 10 a.m. At 10, you go to 200 megawatts. You will start 200 megawatts for half an hour. Then you will move to 300 megawatts. That's the schedule. Okay? And when you uh, try to determine the schedule for all the units, what you want to do is two things. It's to minimize your cost overall. So if you, you want to use your... Uh, units with a low marginal cost as much as possible. And the second thing you want to do is to meet the demand. So you take this load curve, which people are forecasting for you, and you try to find a way of starting this unit, but not this one, and then this one, and so on, and so on. And when you sum up all the schedules of all the power units, it has to meet the demand, no more, no less. Okay? So in this case, decision variables are um, things that tell you when to start the units, which to start, what time, and so on. So this is x, small x, this is variable. That's what you want in the end. Okay? The objective function which you want to minimize is typically a cost, but not always. You could want to maximize or minimize something else, but in practice, it's uh, very often uh, f is usually money some, somehow. Um, the constraints I mentioned before, it's uh, g and h. At the feasible, feasible point is a point which meets the constraints. Feasible set is a set of all feasible points. Um, an optimal point is a solution, so it's uh, some x bar that uh, satisfies all the, everything I, I wrote here. And, and one last uh, word of but vocabulary. So I call this numerical optimization, but really some people call it decision support or operation research. It's more or less the same. It's just all synonyms. Okay. So uh, let's move from equations to uh, picture. So basically, let's say you have oh, see, here, here you have no equality constraint, just two inequality constraints, so it's G1 and G2. So uh, G1 tells you that you want to be on this side of this curve. Okay, You don't want to be there, you want to be there. And G2 tells you that you want on this side of this curve, not here. So the feasible set is this one. And then 
you have a uh, function f. So function f is minimal. OK, I'm not tall enough. I'm tall, but not enough. So f is minimal, is minimal here. And then you have level set. So it's, uh, it's like on a, on a map, you know, the altitude. And so that's where the minimum altitude is up there. And then the altitude goes up. So if there was no constraints, what you want to find is the point up here. But since there are constraints, what you're looking for is a point around here. And that's your optimal solution. That's uh, in a picture what optimization is all about. OK. Now you could ask, OK, this is a very mathematical thing. Uh, I'm really wondering how this could be useful to anyone in the, in the real world. It's actually very useful. So it's uh, used in uh, many, many application areas. So one very large application area is uh, everything that deals with moving things around or people around. Like uh, you have trucks and you want to take some goods from warehouses to shops, or you have planes and you want to decide the schedule of pilots and, uh, and stewards and stewardess and so on and so on. Um, that's actually the same example. Um, it's useful in, uh, in many branches of the industry when you want to control something. So it could be controlling a machine, like a robot arm or something like this. It's also used in, uh, in uh, the chemical industry to control chemical reactions to produce gas or things like this. Um, it's used also to schedule tasks, which means, um, for instance, in a large cluster where you want to schedule jobs and uh, have them uh, processed in the right order. Or in a factory, if you want to choose which jobs are going to be tackled by, by which machine. Um, it's used in the financial industry when you want to choose uh, which assets you should invest on. It's used in the microelectronics industry to choose, for instance, circuit ruling. Many, many problems. OK, uh, in this course, what, uh, the, it's about the area I know better. It's the production and transmission. And I should add also distribution of electricity. Now, um, in this room, half, half people have heard about optimization, so this statement is not quite true. But really, I think it's a very, it's a field that's not very uh, well known, and it's, it should be well known because it's very important. It's very important in practice, and there are some nice mathematics behind it. So it's also nice from the uh, academic viewpoint to study this uh, topic. And it's not maybe I, I think it's not studied or, or taught enough, and not so many people know about optimization. I think it's a pity. Anyway. Let's keep going. Uh, this is a field that's uh, okay. There are some theoretical grounds that uh, started in the, at least in the 18th century, probably b before. And Lagrange, in fact, the name of Lagrange is very important in optimization. I will come back to this uh, later. But really, it started uh, after World War II. So uh, the very let's say the seminal example is the simplex algorithm, which was uh, invented. Uh, by a, name, a guy named uh, Densick. And uh, the application was to, it's a logistics application. So it's, it's all, again, it's, it was about uh, moving things around. And in this case, it was about moving things with military planes to deliver goods and uh, things like this. Um, so it was a very, very important move forward in the field. And then over the next uh, 50, 60 years, there were many, many improvements of the field. So, uh, linear programming, as the name suggests, is about problems where you have everything is linear. So if you go back to my equations before, function f, function g, function h, h everything is linear. Um, this was then generalized in the 50s to nonlinear functions with new applications. In the 60s, there was a very important intro introduction in the field, which is the use of discrete variables. So until then, people were, were tackling continuous variables. So they could not um, use variables to model things like a uh, number of people or machine. Okay, if you want to the optimization program to tell you how, much machine, how many machines you should buy, the answer should not be 2.3. Okay, it makes no sense to buy 2.3 machines. So you have to uh, tell the software to, to, to tell the, the, the model that you actually want to, uh, you want an answer which is an integer number, and that's what people added in the 60s. And, um, and then we arrived to the current situation where people have been working for several decades, and they've put a lot of effort into writing optimization software for some problem classes. And this is very important. We don't know how to solve any optimization problem. Far from that, 
there are a few problems which have the proper structure which we know how to solve. So that's uh, what I want to talk in the second part of the presentation. Now, uh, let me advertise a bit the field of optimization by telling you why it's uh, such a good idea to use it. Uh, the first advantage, which is the most obvious, is of course to improve your objective value. So if you have a problem which is currently solved, let's say, by, by hand, so you have people actually choosing the solution, so they are actually choosing the value of uh, the X decision variables based on their expertise, on many occasions you can do better with the computer. Okay, so you can improve uh, your cost, if the function f is a cost, by having a computer do it. That's obvious, but it's not the only actual benefit. So the second one is to improve constraint satisfaction. So again, if, you, if you're having people doing things by hand, sometimes you don't really miss the constraints. So in, in the case of uh, the unit commitment and dispatch problem, it could mean that people choose the schedules, and then you don't really meet the demand. So you have problems, and you have to solve them by other means. Then, uh, another benefit is that very often the decision task you have to make is repetitive. It's not just one shot. Usually you have to solve it today and tomorrow and the day after, which is exactly the case for the unit commitment problem again. And so, if you have people doing it by hand, they have to think of the problem every day. If you do it with a computer, you have to think of how to write the program, and then you, have, you, can, you just have to run it every day and you don't have to put any more human thinking in the, in the process. Usually also the computer will be faster than a human decision maker. So you get, uh, you accelerate your decision time. Um, in some cases, it's also useful to enumerate solutions. So um, the computer can do this also, not only find you one optimal solution, but to find you uh, several such solutions, which are equivalents of the from the viewpoint of the objective function. And then it's good because you can have a human decision maker look at these options and say, okay, I want this one because it's better from, for other reasons that I couldn't put into the objective because it's not really mathematical, because there are things that you can't really model with, a, with an equation. And so it's uh, sometimes useful to have a human choose among all uh, possible solutions that the computer found. Then there is something which is uh, also very important that optimization provides you when you can't get with a human decision maker. It's sensitivity. So what I mean by this is that if you solve the problem once, you get one solution, x bar. Okay, you should do this. You should start your units tomorrow at this time. So that's good. But then you, can, you may ask, um, what if I changed something? Like, what if the price of coal goes down? Or uh, what if my demand was 100 megawatts higher at this particular time step? Well, optimization actually can tell you this. So, okay, the obvious way is just to run again the optimization pro program. So you can do this. But you don't have to do it, because when you solve the problem, you get the x, so it's what we call the primary solution, which is, uh, again, uh, when and which you need to start, for instance. But you also get something which is less obvious, which we call the dual solution, or the Lagrange multiplier. And I will come back to this later extensively. And the solver will, will give you both. And what the Lagrange multiplier is telling you, really, is this sensitive information, so it tells you how the objective would change if you change a model parameter. So it's very important because it, it, uh, it helps you make decisions also not just about your current optimization problem, but also how the solution would change if you change the parameter of the problem. Okay, uh, so anyway, it's a useful exercise also to model something mathematically. And there are actually very few drawbacks of doing so, so uh, I would advise anyone who has a decision-making problem where things can be reasonably modeled with equations to try to use optimization. It's a very useful exercise. Okay, so I've uh, introduced to you the unit commitment problem uh, like a bit, like, a bit uh, simply like this. Let's go back to a very, very simple problem, a com uh, completely ridiculous pro problem, but it's a toy example. So we have a Let's assume we have a factory, and the factory has two machines, which you call A and B, and you can use them at most nine hours a day, and you're also making two kinds of products, which we call X and Y. If you make one X item, it takes you one hour of machine A and three hours on machine B. You can machine things in any order, A, or a then B, or B then A, no problem. For Y, it's the opposite, so Y 
it takes one hour of mission B and three hours of mission A. And you have different prices. So when you sell these things, X and Y, out of your factory, you get two euros for each X item and three euros for each Y item. So um, it's a very simple problem. How could we solve this uh, without any solver? Well, we could do it. So the question, of course, is how many products of each can you want to make? So um, the answer to this problem is something like, OK, I want to make maybe a 10x item. Or, yeah, you, you can't do this because 10x items will take 30 hours on machine uh, B, and that's too much because you have only nine hours. OK, so let's make five x item, items. <coughs> so you can choose like this. And since it's a very simple problem, um, you can actually solve it by exhaustive search, which means you will try all the combinations. So I've done this in a table. So the first, uh, first column is how many, uh, so OK, how many, how many hours of machine A is used, how many hours of machine B is used, and how many you make. So for instance, in the top left corner, you're not making any x, x equals 0. You're not making any y product, so you're not doing anything. And you're not using any time of machine A, B, and a profit is 0, very simple. If you move to the upper column here, you're making one x item and zero y item. So it takes you three hours of machine A, two hours of machine B, um, three hours of machine B, and your profit is, uh, is two, and so on and so forth. So you, you, what you can see is that in some cases, you're making too much. So in this case here, for instance, you'd like to make one x item and three y item. It doesn't work because you're going to use 10 hours of machine A, and you don't have 10 hours, you just have nine. So what you see here is that really, if you go lower than this or further on the right, you're going to use always more than your nine hours of machine A or B, and you can't do that. So finally, the optimal solution is there. It's to make two of each, and you make profit of, profit of 10. And that's okay. a very simple example of what optimization is about. And the main message here is that this worked because it's a very simple problem, so you can do it by exhaustive search. In practice, you have to use a computer, and the computer will do something like this. It's not going to do an exhaustive search. It's going to take the problem, let's say, from a graphical viewpoint, which is like this. So this is, on this axis, how many x items you're making, and this, on this axis, how many y items you're making, and constraints. And the constraints are like this. It's a, it's a, a linear constraint. So your two constraints are telling you where you can choose uh, your uh, feasible points. So they have to be here. And then your objective function is this. So objective function has level sets which here are like this, because it's a linear objective function. So if I go back to my, very quickly, my previous, previous example, sorry about that. Here's the level sets of the objective function where uh, they had no particular shape. It was the same thing for the constraint because it was an abstract problem. But if you go to a linear problem, which is the one I had, uh, I was showing there, since it's linear, the constraints make linear um, half planes, and the objective is also linear. So what you want to do really is to find, to, to move your straight line like this. And if it's like there, it's not good. OK, all the points here have the same value. All the points here have the same value, but it's higher than before, and so on. So you want to go like this and find the last point, which is on this straight line, and it's that point here. So this is a graphical way of finding uh, the solution, which, again, is uh, making two x items and two y items. And that's what uh, computers do. And the way to tell computers how to do this is to use um, a modeling language. So the part of the software that will solve the problem, it's called the solver. The solver needs things like constraints, like x plus 3y lower than 9, and so on and so forth, which is not, uh, let's say, uh, it's not very convenient for a human being to write these things. So the solver takes these equations and finds, you, finds for you the optimal x solution, and 
how to generate these constraints is done by, um, by another piece of software, which we call the modeler. And this is an example using the Ample language or other languages. So what you do is you write a software like this, a piece of uh, code like this, where you model your uh, constraints, and then the solver will, will uh, output something like this. So I found, the, I found the solution, and your profit will be 10, 10 euros. OK. So um, that's really what people do when they use optimization. They use a modeling language, usually, and they, put the, they ask the solver to find the, to find the solution. Now, there are a few caveats with this, and the main one is that if you just, if you didn't take, if you didn't pay any attention, enough attention in the optimization class, you will likely write equations in your programming language like this, which cannot be solved. Why? Because solvers are very specific tools which can solve very specific classes of problems, and so uh, you need to learn which classes of problems can be solved in order to actually use this this modeling and solving tools effectively. So it's very important to identify which optimization problem classes are known to be solvable. Okay? And there are different solvers for each class of problems. That's a very important skill when you're dealing with optimization. Um, then what would be useful, but uh, I don't have time for this, is to teach you how to use, to actually model yourself optimization problem, and that's where, that's where it would be useful to actually program yourself some ample code, for instance, or other, uh, any other language. And uh, also, of course, you need to be able to, to, to understand what the, the, the solver is telling you. For, for instance, in this case, it told you that it found the optimal solution, that's pretty easy, that the objective is 10, so your profit will be 10, and then it tells you other things which at this point probably are not very uh, clear to you, and it's important to have notions of how solvers work in order to be able to interpret this additional information here. So that's basically the, the objectives of uh, an optimization class. And in this case, we are more concerned about the last point here, which is to apply these tools to solve power, power grid problems. OK, so let's move to the second part of this first uh, hour which is the main problem classes that we know how to solve. OK, so the most important notion in optimization is convexity. So convexity is actually, uh, so there are two things, two different things which are concerned with convexity, which are sets and functions. So this is a non-convex set, and this is a convex set. I guess you've all heard of convexity before. So basically, convexity is a. Uh, this is non-convex because you, if you go from this point to this point, then you can. If you go in straight line from one point to the other, you move out of the set. So it's not it's not convex. And as far as the function is convex, uh, this is non-convex and this is convex. And the reason why it's so important is that because when the problem is convex, in the sense that both constraints and objectives are convex. Uh, then we say that the optimization problem as a whole is convex. And it's very good because you have no local minima in a convex function over a convex set. So if you find a point here which locally looks optimal, which if you look around it, you don't see, don't see any better solution, then you actually have found the optimal solution globally. And if the function is non-convex, then there might be local minima, which means that if you're here and you look around you in a local neighborhood, and you don't see any better point than the current one you have, it doesn't mean that you are actually, you have found the, the optimal solution. It, there could be a much better solution elsewhere like this. So basically, that's the reason uh, why people are so much concerned about convexity in the field of optimization. Then there is another thing which is very important, which I uh, talked a bit about before already, which is the difference between continuous and discrete optimization. So if you remember, remember, but the history of the field, people started with problems where all variables, all decision variables were continuous. And then in the 60s, they started dealing with variables which are integer, which allowed them to model things such as the number of machines or people, which you can't really split in, in, uh, in fractional part. Um, so basically, if everything is continuous, you have a continuous problem, and if you have a mixture of discrete and continuous variables, then it's 
what we call combinatorial, which means you have at least some um, discrete variables. Maybe not, of, maybe not all of them are discrete, but there are at least some discrete variables. And it's going to be much worse because there will be some uh, uh, combinatorial in the problem. It's very relevant to distinguish be between these two problem classes for at least four reasons. The first is that solving does not mean the same thing in both cases. So if you solve a continuous problems, problem, it means that you use an iterative uh, algorithm which will get closer and closer to a solution. At some point, you will stop. But you won't really have found a solution. You have found a point which is good enough. And the actual solution is something that's a mathematical object that you can't reach in practice. In a purely discrete problem, since it's combinatorial, you can actually find the solution because everything is discrete. So you can converge in a finite number of steps to the solution. So solving is really, the, the term solving means something completely different in both cases. Accordingly, the solving algorithms are very different. So the logic of a continuous solver is not the same as a discrete solver. I wanted to explain to you how both work. I will only talk about the continuous solvers because that's what I need to get to my final uh, topic, which is uh, smart grid uh, applications and, and its uh, connection with telecommunication. Because at, at this point, you may think that there is absolutely no connection between this and communication, but it's not correct. <laughs> because eventually, we'll get to distributed optimization. And because it's distributed, then you will have communication. So that's where I want to go. But you have to bear with some mathematics again before I get to that point. OK. So. In this final application, it will be a continu continuous problem. And so I will explain to you later how continuous optimization solver work. And I will skip the part about how discrete solver work. But trust me, it's very different. Now, the last part is tricky. So having um, some discrete variables makes the problem very difficult because there can be a huge number of solutions. If you think of a problem with, with just binary variable, and you have just 100 variables, which is quite small by uh, I mean, in optimization problems, the number of variables grows very quickly. When you want to model something in the real world, you have hundreds of uh, time steps and hundreds of uh, trucks and hundreds of this and that, and you easily end up with tens or thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of variables, sometimes millions of variables. So a problem with uh, just 100 variables is really, really tiny. But even if it's just 100 variables, and they're all binary, then you have 2 to the power of 100 solutions. So um, no solutions, but uh, 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 points. Which means that if you wanted to apply the exhaustive search, which I showed in the beginning for my factory problem, it would take you forever. OK, so this means that at first sight, when you see, uh, at first sight, when you see a combinatorial problem, it looks impossible to solve it. But because we have all these tricks in the combinatorial algorithms, we can actually solve, very often solve in practice, these problems, these problems which at first, at first sight seem impossible to solve given the number of, uh, of feasible points. So anyway, the message is that in this case, um, combinatorial problems seem much more difficult than continuous problems. But on the other hand, what's nice about combinatorial problems is that, OK, they are non-convex. Okay? If, if, if the constraint is that you want only integer points, like this, this being in this set is obviously a non-convex constraint. Okay? Because if you take this point and this point and draw a straight line from one to the other, you get outside of the set. So this set is non-convex, but it's very structured. So the nice thing about combinatorial optimization is that it allows us to tackle non-convex problems in which the non-convexity is under control, which means that, to some extent, non-convex problems are not necessarily hopeless. You can solve them in some cases if you manage to cast the non-convexity as a form of, of uh, an integer constraint. Okay, so. These problems are very difficult at first sight, but they are very expressive. You can express many, many things with them, including non-convexity, which you cannot do with uh, 
continuous uh, optimization. Okay, uh, now which problem classes can we actually solve? The first one, I talked about it before, it's linear programming. It's the first one that was invented by uh, Denzig, by George Denzig in the uh, late 40s. If you look at it with equations, it's like this. So it's our abstract optimization problem in which everything is linear, which means that instead of minimizing f of x, where f is just a function, you're minimizing a linear function, which is the dot product of some constant vector c and x. And similarly, what used to be uh, h of x equals 0, which was a general abstract equality constraint, now we have a linear equality constraint, so some matrix c times x is equal to some given vector d. Same thing for inequality constraints, and x belongs to Rn, which basically can take any value. Okay, so that's linear programming in equations. If you look at it from the graphical viewpoint, it's what I showed before with my factory problems. So all the linear constraints create a polyhedron like this. So the feasible set is always a polyhedron like this. And the objective is linear, which means that, that the level sets are straight lines. And again, if you want to solve this problem, what you're actually doing from the graphical viewpoint is to move your uh, straight line, it could be a ruler, so you move your straight line like this in the direction of the objective, and you find the last point which is inside the feasible set. So in this case, with this point, which is optimal, if you're, if you're maximizing. If you're minimizing, of course, you're going the other way around. So if you're minimizing the objective, you would end up here. That's linear programming. And again, it's the simplest case of optimization, which also means that it's the one we know how to solve. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's the one we know how to solve the best. And this is the type of problem where people routinely solve problems with millions of variables. It's, it's, it's doable. So you can, you can really go to huge problems with, uh, with this uh, simple linear programming framework. Now, if you want to do mixed integer linear programming, so it's the same thing as before, but you've introduced uh, discrete variables. So in this case, everything up there stays the same, but x which, which used to be a continuous variable, so it belongs to Rn, now belongs to, for the first coordinates, to R, and for the last coordinates, to Z, which is an integer point. And again, if you've seen this before. From the graphical viewpoint, it looks like this. So you still have your polyhedron. You still have your straight lines, so the level sets of the objective function. But now you have a new constraint, which is you can't take any value inside the polyhedron. You have to take integer values, which, mean, which means you have discrete point like this, and in this case, the optimal solution would be this one here, because it's the last point you would find when maximizing your objective function among the feasible points. Now, uh, there's also a class which is sometimes used, which is, which is quadratic programming, which is basically, basically this, so the constraints remain linear, but the objective now has a quadratic term, and basically, um, so the, okay, the feasible set is still a polyhedron, and the objective are ellipses. So anyway, uh, there are the classes, but it's not very important for you to know them. And the reason for this is that is the following. So uh, there are solvers for general convex non-linear programming, so you don't assume any structure beside convexity. There are also classes such as uh, general non-linear programming, so you don't even assume co convexity. You can even go to classes where you have both non-linearity and, and, uh, and, and discrete variables. But the, the issue is you won't really be able to solve these problems. And uh, there are actually even, no, even more uh, classes, for instance, you have uh, so some edition programming is one class, one class, uh, and you have plenty of uh, specific problems in uh, in graphs. So, for instance, if you ask your uh, GPS to find you the shortest route from here to uh, Grenoble, it will actually solve an opti optimization problem to find the route. All these problems are very specific, and the reason why I was saying that you don't really need to know them is the following: in practice, people use very, very, very often linear programming 
and its uh, variant with discrete variables, which is a mixed integer linear programming. Sometimes they use non-linear programming, especially when the problem is convex, and they don't really use very often the program classes. And the reason for this is that um, the first two are used the best compromise in the following sense. So if you're considering a very general problem class, like mixed integer, non-linear, non-convex programming, which is basically any problem, you won't be able to solve the problem. So there will be no solvers that actually yield the solution when you click on run. And on the other hand, there are problem classes, such as the one that's solved by the GPS to find the shortest route from here to Grenoble, which really are used only in a very specific case, and you are very unlikely to run into this case in your actual research. So this means that between these two extremes, uh, there, is, there are some problem classes which are general enough, so expressive enough to be of use in many practical situations, and that are not too general in the sense that you can actually solve them eff effectively. And these problems are basically the one at the top, which is linear programming and mixed integer linear programming, and sometimes convex nonlinear programming. So it's very important to, uh, to keep this in mind, because it means that if you actually want to use optimization in your own work, you will have to find a way to cast your problem into one of these classes at the top. It's very unlikely that you will use either a more general class, because it will be too difficult to solve, or a more specific class, because it, it, because it requires some very, very specific knowledge, which only experts have about this particular class of problem. Okay. So, this being said, now you have to know how to practically solve these LP and mixed integer LPs and NLP problems. And if you want to feed them into your computer, you need a way to program them. And that's what modeling languages are about. And so, uh, I'm going to give you a hint of how to do this. How to turn the mathematical problem into computer code using a modeler. So that's basically it for this first uh, lecture, and I've added a few exercises in the end, which you can you can look at uh, on your spare time if you want to practice with the uh, optimization, at least from the theoretical viewpoint. Again, I think it's very important to also practice, so solve some uh, problem with the computer. But if you want to look at theoretical problems, I've put a few here just to 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 help you uh, grasp the problem yourself. Okay. So, now, again, we're going to talk about the um, practice of putting your optimization problem into a computer. And that's what modeling languages and, and modeling software is all about. So, again, you have to distinguish between two software layers, which is solving, so taking the equations and finding the optimal decision variables, and modeling, which is turning the problem from an expression of the problem in human language, not, not human, but uh, let's say a human understandable language, into matrices and then numerical information that the solver will use as an input. So you could use a solver as an input directly, it's possible, but it means that instead of dealing with equations which are meaningful for you as a human, you will have to deal with uh, tables of numbers, so matrices, vectors, and nobody wants to do this. So that's why it's very important to use a modeler. So the modeler is, uh, so modeling to begin with, is the act of writing the optimization problem as equations, so we, which means you have to identify all the elements of the, uh, the equations, the abstract equation I showed you in the beginning, which is function f, the objective, uh, function f, sorry, x, so the uh, decision variables, and all the formulas, the mathematical equations, that define the constraints. That's modeling. And a modeling language, it's a programming language, which is uh, designed to allow human readable and concise representation of an optimization problem. So I think 
I've, I've insisted already on the human readable part. I think the concise part is very important as well because, as you can imagine, if you want to input a one million variable problem into a computer, you really, really, really don't want to write yourself the one million by one, one million matrix that defines constraint. So it means that you need to express your uh, problem in some concise way, and then maybe a few uh, tens or hundreds of lines of code, and then the modeling long, so the, the modeler will transform this into a huge matrix that will be used by the solver. So really, the, mod the modeler is an interface between the human and the solver. That's what it's all about. OK. So um, more in details, here are the features of modeling language and the, and the modeler, the modeling software. The first thing is to assemble the, the problems. That's what I described just before is to put the data in some form, standard form, that will be understood by the solver, which in the case of linear programming, which is the simplest case, means you have to build the matrix and the vectors of the problem. So if you remember what I, when I showed the equations of a linear program, you have one vector, which is the, for the objective. So the objective is some constant vector c dot product x. You need to provide the vector c. The inequality constraints are a times x lower than b, so A is a huge matrix, B is a vector, you have to build all this, all this, uh, all this data. That's what assembling is about. Now, there is a second thing which is a bit trickier, and which is only useful in nonlinear programming, which is to compute the derivatives of con ob objective con constraints. So what I mean by this is that when we will go about how optimization solver work for continuous problems, you will see that it's very important that they are able to compute the gradients of objective and constraints at the current iterate, rate. And uh, that's what the modeling software does. So it's something very useful as well for nonlinear programming. Of course, as far as linear problems are concerned, you don't need to, to compute any constraints because the constraint, uh, gradient, sorry, because the gradient of a linear function is trivial. And then the third point is about pre-processing. So it's uh, basically about modifying the model with simple rules to make it simpler. So in, that, that's very simple, but it's useful as well. So in practice, you may introduce constraints such as, such as x, so, so x1, so the first decision variable, should be, uh, I don't know, larger than 3 and also uh, smaller than 0. So there is no solution. And this can be detected very early in the process. So you don't need to go all along the solving process. You can detect this very early. And that's basically what the pre-processing is about. It's about finding, finding simple ways to reduce the problems or declaring it, declaring it infeasible uh, before solving the actual solving phase. So assembling, I think I've uh, uh, talked about this enough. Um, I think the only thing I should add is that assembling is so important that you really, really, really want your solver to be able to be called from a modeling language. And actually, um, if you don't do it, so if you have a solver which cannot be sold from, from a modeling language, you have to do all the assembling by hand and also to compute derivatives by hand, which is uh, my next topic. And it's very painful. So you should avoid this whenever you can. And basically, this is directed towards one uh, enemy, which is MATLAB. Because if you are using the optimization toolbox of MATLAB, then you have to do this all by hand. By hand. OK, MATLAB, the optimization toolbox of, uh, toolbox of MATLAB cannot be called from a uh, modeling language, which means that from the viewpoint of uh, optimization practitioners, it's basically useless. Of course, in some cases, it can be useful to use a uh, the optimization toolbox of MATLAB because you have some other software which is uh, in MATLAB and you want to plug the two easily and so on and so forth. So, okay, if you're prototyping a big project where you have a little bit of optimization and a little bit of um, something else and this something else is already written in MATLAB, I guess it makes sense to use this toolbox. But really, if you just want, if you just want to tackle an optimization problem, 
probably it's not such a good idea to do it, to do it with MATLAB because you will have to do all the modeling part by hand and it's going to be very, very painful. Okay. Second topic is differentiation. So as I said, when you're tackling a nonlinear program, you need in, in the in the iterates of the continuous optimization algorithm, you will need to evaluate the gradient of the objective and constraints. Now, uh, there are various ways to do this. I guess you know the first two, which are the most well-known, but actually people are using the third. So the first one, symbolic differentiation, is just you take your equations and you derive everything by hand and you get a new formula for the derivative, which is usually much bigger than the previous one. And then you evaluate this. So that's symbolic differentiation. You can also do it not by hand, but using some uh, software like uh, Maple or Mathematica, which are good at doing uh, symbolic calculations. But this is a very, uh, I mean, it, it, it's not practical when you have a large problem because the expression of your gradients will be absolutely huge. So it's, it's not possible to evaluate a gradient like this. Then you have the finite differences, which I guess you also know, which is basically you evaluate your function there and just and then just next to it. So you have f, f at the point x and x plus epsilon, and then you make a difference and you divide by epsilon, and then you get something which more or less like the gradient. So this is not a very good solution either, because first of all, it's approximate. So in the beginning of the optimization process, maybe it's not a big deal because you're far from the objective and uh, having a gradient which is slightly wrong is not a problem. But when you want to find an accurate solution in the end of the optimization process, you really, really, really need a good gradient. So approximations are not good. And the second problem is that it's also very costly because if you want to do this for a function in 1D, you just have to evaluate, you just have to evaluate it twice. Okay, you have a function f here and there, make a difference and divide. But if your function f has dimension n, then you have to evaluate here and here and here for the second dimension and here for the third dimension and so on and so forth, which means that, which means that you have to evaluate it n plus one times where n is a di dimension. And um, if n is big and if your function is costly to evaluate, it's a, a very non-efficient process. So the way modelers actually differentiate uh, functions is called automatic differentiations. It's a very powerful tool and it's a bit difficult to explain so I have uh, an exercise at the end of this lecture which, which explains how to do it. But if I, just, if I can just give you a hint of how it works, the idea basically is to go through all the process of evaluating function f or g or h whatever and every time there is a line of code that does something you had a second line of code that does the differentiated version of, version of it. So basically, you just double your code, which is not too expensive, it's just, uh, I mean just, just doubled. And in the end, the code that you had that was evaluating function f now evaluate, evaluates f and its gradient. And that's the efficient way of doing uh, differentiation. It's very important. I think it's a very useful tool to know. Uh, it's very, very important. So when you're using optimization, you don't, really know to, you don't really need to know this because the modeler is a black box. It will do it all for you. But I think it's important to know this topic both because it will help you understand what the modeler does. And also it can be useful in other situations when, when you actually want to use opt automatic differentiation yourself. Um, Preprocessing, the last of my third, my, my, the last of my three topics about what modelers do. So again, it's about simplifying the user's model. So for instance, if a variable has a constraint such as it should be larger than two and also lower than two, then its value is two. Okay, you can remove it. It's, it's trivial, but if you do this at a large scale on a large problem, you will, in some cases, you will significantly reduce it, and the solver will see a problem which is smaller than you, th than you thought. So everything that can be done beforehand, before feeding the solver with a large problem is useful. Uh, in some cases, you can improve uh, bounds by uh, using simple rules. You can also eliminate inequality. So it's basically the uh, same thing as first point. First point is about reducing the size of the problem by elim eliminating variables whose value is trivially fixed. And the third point 
is about eliminating from the problem uh, inequalities which are trivial, trivially useless. And it does a few other things. So that's what pre-processing is about. Now, uh, in order to model a problem efficiently, um, it's important to know how to turn expressions that you face in practice into mixed integer constraints. And that's actually uh, very tricky. And there's a list of tricks that people should know. Um, I'm not going to explain you all of these tricks because there are many of them, but um, and actually sometimes are really, really tricky. I mean, in the unit commitment problem, for instance, that I intended to show you in the beginning, there are some constraints. I mean, when you look at them, there is no way you can guess what they are doing. And actually, they are implementing something such as a minimum downtime. So if you turn down a unit, you have to let it uh, rest for maybe three hours before starting it up again. Ex expressing this constraint in terms of mixed integer equations is really tricky, and, and that's where a lot of the skills of the optimization experts uh, lies. It's within their ability to express as mixed integer linear equations uh, some tricky constraints. So I'm not going to explain again all of these tricks, but I need you to know that they exist. And uh, the message here is that Okay, you need to find out in your problem which equations can be cast into mixed integer uh, formulas. If you want to put everything in your problem, all the physics, so you look at a problem from a purely engineering perspective and not from an optimization perspective, it would be very tempting to put a lot of uh, details, physical details, and you will end up with something which is horribly complex. So again, it could be uh, non-linear and non-convex and mixed integer. So you put all the difficulties at once. So as an engineer, you're very happy because you've put a lot of physics in the problem. But from the optimization perspective, you did a bad job because you won't be able to do anything with your formulation. So the message here is that the goal when using optimization is really never to put all the effort into the quality of the modeling. It's to find a compromise compromise between the quality of modeling from the engineering viewpoint and from the feasibility of solving the problem practically, which means, again, to the ability to cast your problem into uh, a solvable problem class. And what I mean by solvable problem class really means, most of the time, linear or mixed integer linear programming, or sometimes convex nonlinear programming. Okay. So that's basically what I said before. So the modeling is really a compromise between the accuracy of a model and your ability to use it in the calculations. Um, OK. The kind of things you can do with mixed integer linear constraints, on, which is absolutely not trivial at first sight, is you can express things like an absolute value. Okay, you can write something like x is equal to the absolute value of y. Okay, this is obviously non-linear, but if you introduce um, a binary variable and if you combine this variable with x and y uh, in a clever way, then you can get something which is, which is mathematically equivalent to an absolute value. Same for min and back. So let's say you want to, tell that, uh, to say that uh, x is the minimum of the two values of variable y and variable z. That's obviously non-linear. And yet, again, by adding some uh, art new, let's say, artificial variables, you can express it as a mixed integer program. It's the same for many, many things. You can even express logical conditions, like if, and, or, between bin binary variables. You can do many, many of these things. You can even introduce piecewise affine functions. So again, a function which looks absolutely nonlinear. But if it's linear, by pieces, piecewise linear, piecewise affine, then um, again by introducing some dummy artificial integer variables, then you can get something which is equivalent to your piecewise linear function. And there are plenty of other things you can do with this. So one message, the message I want to tell you here is that mixed integer linear programming is probably much, much, much more expressive than you think. When you look at it, you say, well, my, my problem is nonlinear. Okay, the end, I can't use MILP. Well, maybe you're wrong. 
maybe it's if you model it, model it in a clever way, then you'll be able to cast your problem into the realm of uh, MILP. Okay, so yeah, again, what I just said, so because these tricks exist, MILP is actually very expressive, much more than you think, and, and that's the reason why it's widely used in practice, and also because, of course, we, we actually can solve these problems effectively. So, because, I mean, MILP is in many, many occasions the proper compromise between being very expressive, so it's quite general, and yet it's structured enough so that you can actually solve the problem in practice. So MILP solvers are very, very uh, advanced tools, and there are three big names in, the, in commercial solvers, in which decades of effort by the world's best programmers have been put. And because of this, these three solvers and some others are really, really efficient tools, thanks to which you can, use, you can uh, solve huge problems in the MILP class. So when you look at this, so the expressivity and also the, the, effic the efficiency of solvers, uh, you get to the conclusion that in many, many cases that's the kind of uh, solver you want to, to use, and also to the conclusion that you should try to cast your problem into an MILP whenever possible. Okay. Um, I will skip this part just to uh, because it's uh, it's about the ample language or the language that one of the languages that you can use to actually implement a problem in practice. It would be important if we had some uh, hands-on class, but since it's not the case, I don't think it's very useful that I, I give you information about this particular language. So I'll stay at the theoretical level and skip that part. Okay. And that's one hour. So, do you, are we still going? Or <laughs> I, I, I'm not tired yet. But <laughs> maybe you are. <laughs> maybe we can have a break now and then continue, then another break. Okay, so let's take two breaks. So one now and one. In. Okay, two short breaks instead of one long break. Okay, so uh, let's take uh, maybe ten minutes or. Okay, so let's get back here in ten minutes.